for uh, digital uh, construction solutions uh, based on this idea of global positioning and economic diversification. Um, of course, with, with other countries, because the focus is more on traditional kind of infrastructure and transport to residential projects, um, uh, it's a bit less uh, common, but the intent is uh, to kind of uh, more augment and explore uh, these kind of investing in digital solutions. Right now, of course, UAE and Saudi Arabia are early adopters of this technology in the construction sector. Uh, but as uh, Maggid al-Hawari here says, uh, others will, will typically follow. This is kind of the typical cycle of technology, as with uh, earlier technologies and, and early CAD and so on. Uh, you typically have leaders in adoption and others uh, follow at a later stage. It's just about the right kind of path, the right track, what to invest in, uh, what kind of technology specifically to invest in and so forth. Um, in terms of the um, where the digital investment is and, and uh, how these construction companies uh, see that from this uh, survey, uh, BIM actually came in, in, in first place, uh, the biggest area of digital investment uh, over the past uh, two years, typically also by UAE and Saudi Arabia, using what's called the model first uh, working practice in major projects like the Red Sea project in Saudi Arabia, the Palm Jumeirah in UAE, Maktoum, Al Maktoum International Airport and the Expo 2020 and so forth. Um, this typically came as the biggest area of investment. Uh, not surprisingly, the second area uh, that came uh, was cloud computing or cloud technology. Um, and um, this is kind of, um, um, as, as Anas Batao says here, it's these cloud-based technologies offer a host of benefits. Um, despite kind of the security concerns, but they offer flexibility, cost effectiveness, uh, mobility of use and are future proof. And um, also, again, one of the um, silver linings of the pandemic is that the, um, the economic damage that was shown and caused by long term lockdowns and reduced personnel on work sites demonstrates that the infrastructure that support these kind of remote working scenarios is becoming critical. And uh, actually cloud-based technologies really fulfill that uh, need in a way. And so people are moving more and more into using, um, uh, rather than acquiring new software and technologies, they're moving into subscription services, software as a service, SAS, uh, storage as a service, infrastructure as a service, and so on. So this is becoming uh, a trend of the time. Uh, and also moving from capital expenditure to operational sort of expenditure models. Now, after these kind of two uh, uh, digital investments, there come also a, another suite of, of um, uh, investment areas related to mobile applications, drones, uh, Internet of Things, uh, enabled equipment, sensor networks and the like, uh, augmented reality, generative design, autonomous vehicles and 3D printing. Well, so it's a bit kind of not that high, but there is also an appetite for digital investment in, in, the, uh, in the MENA region as well. Um, also, um, another kind of aspect in this uh, survey relates to the uh, what is the expected sort of uh, phase of the project cycle that can be best improved through digital uh, transformation. And so... Uh, one of the highest things was site execution, for example, more and more on the uh, construction uh, side, uh, design development, operations and maintenance and so forth. These are coming in, in the forefront. And um, uh, also in relation to the pandemic aspect, actually digital transformation has uh, already been actually underway uh, before COVID, but it has the kind of relatively ben benefit somehow is that it has further accelerated the process. Because during the, the, the lockdown, the, uh, the power of this technology was um, shown to uh, enable and facilitate a lot of remote work collaboration, uh, streamlining a lot of procedures and operations, uh, automating and uh, manual processes and so forth. As we have all seen, um, we have seen transformations that and we have seen practices that are emerging and transforming in ways we didn't think that they would emerge that way because of the uh, uh, the need and the um, uh, problem that uh, occurred during the pandemic. We have seen ways to overcome that. And this typically should not go away. It should be integrated within uh, mainstream uh, practices. 
Now, another kind of uh, area, which is also specific to challenges that are specific to the MENA region, is this dilemma we have with um, globalization versus heritage somehow, if you can call it that way. And um, uh, typically, uh, usually, as we can see in some of the um, uh, growing uh, cities and projects that are out there, there is uh, a notion to kind of follow globalization uh, strictly, where uh, global forms and concepts are imported uh, sort of blindly in a way, utilizing new materials, smart materials, uh, a lot of glazing, a lot of um, uh, sort of global aspects. Uh, and there are other, on the other hand, um, other projects are kind of um, uh, on another end are following uh, blindly and strictly the heritage component uh, as a replica of the past, actually ignoring some of the uh, or downplaying some of the new design and construction technologies. Uh, now, of course, in between there are there's an interesting uh, kind of new type of architecture that sort of integrates the authentic with the modern in a way this typical dilemma of the contemporary and the, and the heritage, um, still is inspired by heritage, uses as well sustainable and aesthetic elements, and also employs digital technologies in, in generative aspects, in construction and in uh, materials. Um, this is part of the findings of, of, an, of an article uh, that, uh, typic that um, um, focuses specifically on the three aspects related to what we as uh, pro professionals and practitioners in the region would typically think about. Um, on the one hand, you have this computational kind of driver um, related to uh, uh, design, related to construction and management, uh, whether it's about BIM, about uh, algorithmic thinking, about generative design, about uh, pattern and form generation, about digital fabrication and the like. Um, and also we have on our minds a sustainability aspect typically in the region that we are in, uh, looking at microclimate aspects, site aspects, resources, and, 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 and lead accreditation and so on. And we have the aspect of that localization or regionalism factor, which is really related to uh, cultural values, traditional uh, sort of uh, techniques, uh, looking at planning aspects, compact planning, traditional kind of ventilation, low cost uh, aspects, uh, courtyards, design elements, mashrabeyas, patterns, and, and so forth. And uh, the dilemma of how to kind of make sense of all of that becomes into the equation. And, and this article very nicely laid out that uh, uh, there is a kind of a weighted uh, element kind of scenario in this uh, approach or design approach where um, it analyzed some of the major uh, projects out there in the MENA region, like Mazda Institute, Abu Dhabi, Al Bahar Towers, Abu Dhabi, also uh, the Kaust University in Saudi Arabia, the Abdulaziz Center for World Culture, the, uh, our campus here, the American University in Cairo, and uh, the University of St. Joseph uh, Campus for Sports and Innovation. And interestingly, there were uh, kind of different weights in terms of what were the drivers, what, what driver was more kind of dominant while looking at these kind of um, uh, projects and, and studying them. So obviously there are computational driven sort of approaches that uh, put kind of computation uh, as a major kind of key player in almost all of the building phases. Uh, looking at form and, and formal compositions and interweaving patterns and so on, uh, innovative sustainability techniques using computation and, and simulation techniques and the like, um, prefab elements, uh, the look, uh, the modern look and so on, and um, revisiting some of the traditional forms and patterns in a, in a novel way, for example. So these kind of were exhibited in projects such as uh, uh, Bahar Towers, as we all know how it took the uh, kind of the Mashrabeya idea, but it took it into a very kind of kinetic responsive element scenario, uh, very, very high end, very uh, high tech in a way. And uh, with automation, with, with um, uh, kinetics, with gadgets, motors, uh, pattern generation techniques, parametric ideas, uh, also looking into energy efficiency, environmental simulation, and so on. Uh, the same with Mazda Institute, the same with Abdulaziz Center for Rural Culture. And while other, the other projects had different weights, actually they integrated computation in different levels, but they were more, for example, regionally driven, such as the AUC campus, more sustainably 
kind of uh, driven as in the uh, KAUST campus and so on. And um, uh, that way, it, computation actually um, was shown to be demonstrated in different kind of factors, whether it's uh, from the design level, from the design phase, whether it's related to uh, form finding, uh, pattern generation using uh, uh, integration of, of BIM, environmental simulation, and so on, whether it's in the simulations of the structural analysis and form optimization for construction and digital fabrication within the construction phase, or in the management as well and operation of the building and uh, looking at um, Internet of Things, looking at automated energy systems, automated louvers, um, uh, responsive systems, movable panels, solar screens, and, and so on. So this became kind of um, defining somehow the framework of uh, where some of these projects are really driven, what are they driven by? Uh, and uh, typically what I just want to get out of this is that it's, it's a more complex equation in the MENA region. Um, uh, if you were to do this in, um, uh, in, in the West, for example, or in Europe and the US, um, typically not all of these equations uh, or factors uh, come to mind, uh, especially about uh, regionalism, about heritage, about culture, about uh, how to incorporate many of these, uh, but this actually can be very enriching in the process and can serve actually the computational aspect. So the computational driver here becomes a bit much more even richer because it builds on sustainability and it builds on regionalism or localization in a way and it incorporates all of these. So this presents an interesting opportunity uh, for us as practitioners in the region when looking at these aspects, it becomes an inspiration, it becomes a driver rather than just looking at uh, blind uh, abstract uh, forms and that's it. Um, and uh, globally as well, we're looking into, um, uh, of course, computational design research as one of the main kind of um, uh, drivers for what we are doing here in, in terms of, of practice. Uh, there is a transformation, there is a sort of a paradigm shift somehow in the uh, research paradigms out there. So what we used to see as typical form generation and generative methods and so on is moving more and more into rule-based automation, moving into AI, more into machine learning, deep learning, and so on. We're seeing that in a lot of um, uh, research uh, initiatives out there. We're seeing the move from mass production to mass customization because of the uh, capabilities and affordances by digital tools and techniques. We're seeing where we are moving from uh, an artifact or product-centered scenario to a human-centered scenario, uh, from the physical to the experiential or phenomenological, from um, uh, the physical to the physical computing to Internet of Things to big data and using that data and data analytics and so on in terms of evaluation, in terms of optimization, in terms of management and operation as well um, uh, in, in later phases in the design. And, and so here I'm just going to focus on uh, a specific uh, aspect of, um, uh, of computational design, which is designed to robotic production. And um, typically, of course, robots are there, um, uh, not, not so recent in, in, the, in the business industry in general, uh, but actually uh, what used to be known as industrial robots uh, a long time ago, um, contemporary industrial robots actually are uh, being now distinguished from earlier versions by their, the notion of their versatility, uh, becoming more adaptable, becoming more open-ended, uh, no specific restriction to a given uh, disciplinary uh, focus. Uh, the notion is becoming more about uh, what you see on the image on the left from this kind of rigid industrial automation and physical production lines and so on to more what you see on the right, more of a creative capacity, more of uh, looking at maybe uh, generative designs, looking at form generation in a unique way, transforming even how we as architects uh, approach design and approach construction. So there is a bit of a transformation happening there, although it's the same kind of equipment and tool, but there is a, a difference in the, in the thinking. And uh, rather than being perceived here as machines that are only suited for mechanistic, very functional, very mass production purpose oriented uh, machines and gadgets, 
uh, robots are actually increasingly becoming understood as these creative tools for, for exploration, for design, for making uh, in the fabrication world sense uh, in the built environment. Um, and, and so it's building as well in terms of uh, design and construction, building on this collaborative capacity, interdisciplinarity uh, between different, uh, from designers to artists, to mathematicians, to manufacturers, to biologists sometimes, who are looking at biomimicry or looking at material science and engineering and, and so on. And this, of course, some of the pioneers in that are uh, a lot of the uh, European labs in that regard. But why in the first place robotics in architecture and construction? And of course, this will be a, a question later on, of course, for, okay, are we even able to do that in, in our region? We are barely kind of scratching the surface on some of the bare uh, minimum kind of technologies, but what, what is being presented here? And it's just an open-ended uh, question. But as um, uh, HMC Architects here um, uh, tells us that uh, robots actually will have an equally sort of integral role in the industry, in the AEC industry, the same way as what how BIM used to do and the same way that we see now Portland Cement, for example, at the beginning, uh, dramatically sort of enhanced and improved the way we design and construct buildings. And um, they're telling us that architects who embrace this kind of technology now will be better equipped to actually design the most efficient buildings of the future. And some of the um, uh, added values here that are expected in, in using or implementing robotics uh, have to do with the, uh, the speed, the sort of uninterrupted, sort of non-fatigue non pace of, of construction, the um, uh, components that are built by robots that are sort of consistent in terms of quality, in terms of form, less error prone, uh, and so on, um, working within critical conditions, critical climates, uh, which could be an asset in, in, in our region in some cases, um, works of demolition, works of complex construction work, whether at the detailed level or the very large scale level, giga project level, um, reduced um, uh, operation costs, um, uh, less manpower, leaner uh, construction and leaner operation uh, in general. Now the low hanging fruit here becomes uh, kind of uh, several fold. It, it relates to the uh, modeling aspect where there is a continuous sort of generation and testing of accurate small scale uh, 3D building models through the 3D printing, uh, milling small and large custom building components with a high level of precision and detail, uh, assembly as well, whether it's for the very basic um, uh, bricks components and other building components using robots, drones, and, and long robotic arms and so on. Uh, also real time sort of troubleshooting and as well uh, energy efficiency where um, uh, small bots can be actually embedded and programmed in building spaces and facades and so on to meet um, sustainability uh, goals. Um, as we can see here in this um, uh, chart, actually looking at the ro robots or robotics in, in the construction market, the um, global market for construction uh, robotics actually represents a huge opportunity for uh, developers and suppliers. It, it uh, could grow from uh, $22.7 million in 2018 to $226 million by 2025. Um, and so according to this International Federation of, of Robotics and the Robotic Industries Association, the construction uh, robotics market will experience a compound annual growth of 8.7 percent between 2018 and 2022. So there is sort of um, a revolution that's uh, driven by this automation and digitization in the construction industry. Typically, as all of you probably know the construction industry is usually slow in, in adopting new technologies, but uh, uh, hopefully with this kind of, uh, of, of, of these techniques uh, from design through final inspection and maintenance, um, of course, these, these full benefits are, are still yet to be realized. But of course, there are a lot of areas where these can come in handy, especially when we're talking about uh, uh, whether it's off-site uh, automated prefab systems, whether it's on-site uh, automated and robotic systems, whether it's autonomous vehicles and sort of standalone uh, vehicles and drones, 
and also um, wearables, wearable devices, uh, which they call exoskeletons. All of these can become part of the construction sort of landscape in a way. Uh, there are typically uh, now uh, a lot of key players in the market out there. Uh, when we look specifically at, for example, concrete uh, or 3D, 3D printing, concrete 3D printing solutions, uh, one of the uh, companies out there, uh, Cybe, is also looking at this into the construction industry and developing uh, mobile and modular uh, technology, also construction robotics, which is uh, specialized in uh, the smart uh, bricklaying and lifting uh, systems uh, to reduce risk and enhance uh, labor safety. And uh, also a fast brick wall um, a company which develops what's called Hadrian X, which is an autom autonomous robot system for uh, efficient bricklaying for residential projects. So it's coming in, in the pipeline. These sort of technologies are globally kind of uh, invading the, the market uh, somehow. Um, also, in terms of, of research, there are lots of opportunities out there that have been ongoing in the last 10 to 15 years um, aggressively in terms of research in computational design labs, uh, specifically Gramazio and Kohler um, uh, Research Lab in ETH Zurich, uh, which has done a lot of extensive work with different materials, with different structures, uh, with, with robotics, with 3D printing, with uh, many uh, sort of um, uh, adjustable mold scenarios, on-site robotic construction, uh, mesh mold prefab, uh, timber assembly, and so on. It has been looking at this area at this specific area for a long time now and has been uh, really informing the uh, starting to inform the industry and, and practice uh, out there. Also, the very famous uh, ICD lab uh, Institute for Computational Design and it's coupling with the ITKE lab, which is more on the material science and biocomposites side and hand in hand, they develop these kind of large scale pavilion like elements, which uh, now are moving on and on into sort of mainstream architecture. That's the um, uh, that's the hope that these kind of pavilion scale move into the actual mainstream architecture. And these are very promising initiatives uh, with high level of technology and material science integration. Um, and as said earlier, these require a lot of interdisciplinary kind of collaboration. Uh, also, the IAC or the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, which is uh, uh, spe specialized also in the uh, robotics uh, uh, research uh, as well. Uh, some areas of application and architecture that relate to these relate to ideas uh, such as material and processes, uh, like the pavilion we see here developed by the ICD lab, which looks at modular assembly of carbon fiber composites. Uh, with multiple kind of um, uh, on-site uh, robotic uh, scenario. So this, as you can see on the lower left, this structure has been kind of on-site built, being built by the robot with these carbon fiber composites. Uh, also uh, mobile robotic uh, uh, fabrication as well, using uh, heterogeneous kind of mobile robotic fabrication strategies um, specific to filament materials and deploying sort of these smaller uh, robots for uh, manipulating uh, lightweight uh, thread-like uh, uh, materials, uh, which allows actually for building significantly larger structures. So many of these attempts are looking at how the modular can uh, use a certain technology, but in order to be able to expand into a large scale structure at the end of the day. Um, also, another uh, interesting idea is the idea of fabrication and control. And in this um, uh, example here, it uses uh, a sort of a multi-axis um, clay 3D printing on, on freeform molds um, and using uh, also an industrial robot and uh, it applies it to large scale fabrication of, of ceramic panels. And it uses this kind of uh, extruder or syringe type extruder with a high uh, torque step motor and, and the screw jack and um, using different kind of robotic tools, um, hot wire cutter and spindle and, and clay extruder and so on, uh, on top of this uh, expanded uh, polystyrene uh, freeform mold. This is also another opportunity for fabricating with different materials, uh, looking at, uh, I'm reflecting on natural 
materials that you can find uh, within our uh, local kind of environments. Um, uh, not necessarily, it doesn't have to be necessarily very expensive materials, but you can um, uh, look at um, uh, a lot of uh, earth materials and uh, work with 3D printing techniques uh, to, to get a bit relatively a low cost kind of construction and a large scale construction at the end of the day. Uh, many other kind of techniques as well with uh, structure and construction in general, architectural scale kind of concrete 3D printing for fabricating uh, rapidly constructed structurally optimized concrete uh, lattice structures and also uh, automated path planning for uh, robotically assembled spatial structure. So this provides another opportunity for spatial kind of structure um, uh, components uh, with an integration of uh, an automated kind of uh, approach uh, methodology for, uh, for the planning of how the robot would kind of uh, assemble that. And it becomes a bit sort of fabrication uh, aware in a way. But this also provides another opportunity for a different kind of unique innovative uh, type of uh, of construction and expanded as well into uh, large scale structures um, another um, uh, example also developed at ETH Zurich relates to the um, large scale sort of multi robotic uh, brick laying mechanism it was sort of the or they call it the brick labyrinth and it's the first uh, large scale construction uh, built in that robotic uh, fabrication lab uh, for automated uh, prefabrication uh, with a dry stacked uh, construction method. So this presents another opportunity for uh, streamlining the process in a way with your typical kind of uh, building unit or building brick. Uh, also uh, another uh, attempt with ceramics and ceramic constellations using also uh, robotic um, uh, 3D uh, robotic uh, clay printing to manufacture a sort of flexible and performative uh, system of robotically printed um, brick special units with the goal of optimizing uh, of optimization and resulting in a potential reduction uh, in, in the materials as, as you can see a bit hollow and so on so it's uh, kind of optimizes material weight and uh, results in an enhanced and increased uh, sort of usability and, and purpose fitness in a way. Um, also going more into uh, concrete uh, with the idea of uh, a dynamic uh, slip form concrete uh, casting, uh, uh, where it's a kind of a concrete extrusion method, method uh, based on a robotic arm technique uh, as well with on-site fabrication and uh, a design-oriented installation that also looks at energy uh, efficiency as well. Um, and also going more and more into large-scale components, um, uh, large-scale concrete additive uh, manufacturing um, by producing this ultra-high uh, performance concrete complex uh, element and uh, using material science and computation and robotics as well. It's an innovative way of, of 3D printing also uh, cementitious materials. So that's what's more interesting uh, about this scenario. Um, what's interesting here is that the more you go, you see uh, different techniques that are being used by robots because you know the end effector of a robot can be fed by any kind of uh, different tool. So here it's more of a sewing technique actually rather than extrusion or depositing or assembly. Uh, or milling or so on. This is a kind of a sewing or knitting mechanism. And that presents an interesting uh, technique that uh, couples this uh, sensing mechanism with uh, industrial sewing uh, techniques to explore uh, new strategies for fabricating these uh, thin wooden shells. So it's uh, typically uh, with uh, wood uh, shells. Also, uh, there are interesting uh, areas where uh, now the uh, metal 3D printing also is being used for fabricating large scale structures. One of the very famous ones is the uh, bridge in Amsterdam developed by uh, MX 3D uh, company. Also it's being used for, um, as you can see in this column on the left in um, structural connections. This is by uh, a company called uh, Takinaka. Um, in, in Japan, and it depends on the technology of wire arc additive manufacturing or, or WAM. 
and um, it, it typically goes through the scenario of presenting this joint or, or connection uh, rather than developing the whole system with uh, this technology. It depends on using these flexible sort of modular elements using uh, metal uh, 3D printing and also the uh, uh, interesting project as mentioned, the large scale uh, bridge scenario. It's a 3D printed uh, steel bridge uh, a 12 meter long stainless steel pedestrian bridge and it's uh, developed in, in, in 2019 and um, here also the uh, uh, now the boundaries are being stretched in terms of um, uh, how what this technology is is capable of looking at this amount of wire and stainless steel and and so on with a lot of structural obviously analysis and testing but it has been demonstrated and proven now that this sort of uh, 3D metal printing is being effective in large scale structures, uh, at least. Another uh, example that is uh, relevant to that, uh, developed by Foster and Partners, uh, what they call the massive, massive hybrid manufacturing of 3D metal as well. It's another 3D metal um, uh, technology idea. And we have recently also conducted a workshop um, with the Digital Futures Organization here at AUC, using uh, capitalizing on the benefits of uh, or the potentials of WAM or wire arc additive manufacturing um, uh, with a robotic arm here at the Mechanical Engineering Department. We collaborated with them um, in, in that regard. And there are many potentials for um, how we can use wire arc additive manufacturing in architecture, uh, which is clearly also an intriguing and uh, triggering uh, scenario. This project was um, uh, sort of a proof of concept for what's called the large scale additive subtractive integrated modular machine. Um, it's sort of, as you saw maybe in the images, a large machine. It's not just a one uh, robot, but it's a kind of a whole uh, gadget. It's claimed to reduce the manufacturing time and cost by, by 20% and increase productivity for high volume additive manufacturing uh, production by uh, 15%. Um, of course, many of these are, uh, uh, are just eye openers for uh, a lot of uh, research that's coming uh, forward. Uh, here at AUC, we have done some research at the Department of Architecture, uh, looking at uh, uh, double curved facade panels uh, using robotic uh, simulation, where we have an adjustable mold and uh, an optimized sort of design to robotic uh, production of these double curved facade uh, panels through a whole kind of workflow and process. This is part of the process using also vacuum forming along the process and um, a multi-point forming scenario for adjusting uh, the mold because you can do so much with just the one mold. So it becomes an adjustable mold, a flexible mold that you can use several times and then you can produce uh, multiple uh, panels uh, accordingly by adjusting the uh, geometry directly to that uh, mechanism and the robot will um, extrude uh, whatever material we're looking at. Uh, this is a project in progress. We're looking at uh, extruding uh, a clay, uh, the position on these panels for uh, double curved uh, facades, which is a bit uh, interesting to, to look at instead of a typical uh, glazing or very expensive kind of uh, materials. So that's uh, currently under research. We're also uh, doing uh, robotic simulation and assembly of uh, parametric brickwork configurations based on the uh, solar map of uh, these brick walls. So this presents an opportunity and a potential for us when we're looking at uh, sort of mainstream uh, buildings in Egypt. For example, uh, you can, with a very tiny tweak of the brick configuration, brick bonds and brick extrusions, uh, and coupling that with a mechanism that would lay down the brickwork uh, assembly automatically, um, we could get a reduction uh, around 27% of the uh, uh, solar heat gain. So that uh, presented an opportunity for us as well. And um, uh, this is in collaboration with uh, Professor Khaled Tarabi here at the department. Uh, and it's currently also in the digital simulation uh, phase and looking forward to implement this in um, uh, on site. Um, also, we have been looking at, uh, sorry, waiting for the slide to, to move, yes. Uh, also, we have been looking at the, uh, what we call the soft adaptive uh, building skins for energy efficient architecture. Here, we're building on um, the uh, property of wood, the hygroscopic property of wood in 
shrinking and swelling based on the uh, moisture content in the air. So, uh, but we have developed this so that, so as you know, the hygroscopic property allows uh, a material like an orthotropic material like wood to move and shrink and swell. And we are using this as a low cost kind of approach for uh, responsive facades that can move according to environmental conditions or uh, user behavior. Uh, and also we are extending this to working with uh, specific shading device scenarios and solar screens and also uh, emulating that with um, uh, 3D printing, actual artificial uh, uh, 3D printed uh, wood with another composite, with a metal composite that um, uh, responds to actually uh, temperature and not only humidity. So it's a composite now that we are developing, uh, working with both temperature and humidity as external factors and Basically, we're in the process of um, getting these uh, uh, composite uh, louver screens out, uh, 3D printed now, so uh, that they respond actually to uh, both temperature and humidity, and they are a very kind of low cost uh, approach and low tech approach to, um, yes, there is a 3D printing component that is there, but also uh, it's in general, it's a low tech uh, approach uh, generally. Uh, also, this is part of our research with um, uh, automated sort of uh, facility and property management of uh, based on BIM and GIS, uh, where we uh, we have uh, looked at different examples in the Emirates and, and Saudi Arabia and uh, other uh, countries in the Gulf, where we operate this system on uh, existing uh, buildings in terms of management and operation life cycle management of buildings using the power of uh, BIM to the uh, highest level of, of detail, and also GIS in terms of the infrastructure and the geoanalytical tools to help uh, facility managers in the uh, uh, management and operations and life cycle of the whole and the reporting of issues and, and so on, and task management and asset management of their uh, projects uh, for the building life cycle. Uh, now, this takes us to the, um, I know I'm almost out of time, but this takes us to the last uh, segment. And as part of being uh, uh, honored again by serving as president of the of the ASCAD organization, just wanted to give uh, a brief overview of the uh, Arab Society for Computer Aided Architectural uh, Design. Uh, it's a society of those who um, teach and conduct research and practice in, in the CAD area or design computing area. Um, in the Arab world uh, region, North Africa, West Asia, uh, also in Central Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa and the Mediterranean. Um, it's one of these, as you see on the left, one of these five sister organizations that promote CAD research and education uh, worldwide. Uh, Acadia in North America, ACAD in Europe, CADRIA in Asia, and SIGRADI in South America. And the primary goal is to, for, for the whole community is to facilitate communication information exchange regarding the use of uh, computing and digital technology and architecture and, and planning and building science. And ASCAD has been established since 2005, uh, preceded by some of these organizations which go a, a, a bit uh, earlier than that since 1983, I think, ECADI. Um, but the benefit of having regional organizations like this is that uh, promoting the uh, issues that are specific to that uh, uh, region and holding uh, uh, an annual conference and activities and uh, workshops, educational events uh, hosted by different universities and educational institutions uh, 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 regularly. Uh, we have um, attracted subject expert authors uh, to uh, publish their uh, papers and scientific work. Usually we get around 180 paper submissions and abstracts uh, per conference, and we end up with a rigorous process going around the rate of 30 to 40% acceptance for high quality uh, papers. Uh, we have authors worldwide, not only in the Arab region, who contribute and participate and, and moderate our sessions and uh, review our papers. Um, uh, very high quality uh, experts in, in terms of the review process as well. Our past conferences have been uh, around the Arab uh, region, starting with um, uh, Dahran in, in Saudi Arabia from 2005 and ending by, uh, we just had our conference this year in March at AUC here, American University in Cairo, uh, virtually, obviously, and, and online. Um, and this was the ninth international uh, conference. Each year, there is typically a theme 
that relates to a specific theme within computation and how it relates to research and education and practice. Uh, this year's theme was architecture in the age of disruptive technologies, transformation and, and challenges. Uh, we typically attract prominent uh, keynote speakers uh, in the area of computational design, very famous figures in, in, um, in the area of computational design in terms of research, academia, and, and practice as well. Uh, this year, we had Dennis Sheldon, who was previously in Gary Technologies. We had Patrick Schumacher from Zaha Hadid Architects. We had Hana Dahi from uh, the ITKE lab in Stuttgart, Germany. And we also had Christian uh, Derricks. Um, this was our uh, conference for, for this year at, at AUC. We had uh, a very interesting conference and outcomes. And these are some of the main conference themes that we had just to give you an idea of what kind of issues are being discussed and how these can really be informative in terms of uh, uh, research and academia on the one hand, but also how it can, how these outcomes can really relate to the profession and relate to practice and what the trends are in terms of um, uh, moving the collaboration between research and industry. Human computer interaction, for example, uh, emergent modes of, of learning, more into the educational side. Uh, architectonic languages, more about generative parametric design, uh, responsive and interactive architecture, digital fabrication, and design to robotic production that we talked about today, uh, and also programmable and smart materials. That's part of our uh, research that we discussed earlier. Uh, and also BIM and uh, computer supported design collaboration, but also other specific themes to, uh, to the region, like, for example, digital heritage or virtual heritage or digital humanities or smart cities in, in some of our uh, uh, cities that are developed now in the MENA region, uh, adoptable uh, built environments. Uh, also, the, the topic of digital twinning now is gaining a lot of traction in, in many of the uh, giga projects right now. So many of these topics are uh, very important to discuss with these uh, within these conferences um, and in order to inform uh, the uh, CAD community at large and also present opportunities for collaboration with the industry as well. Uh, we have also been uh, doing interesting collaborations with the sister organizations. So not only within ASCAD, but also with the five uh, sister organizations. Uh, we had just launched last year what's called the First World uh, CAD PhD workshop. Uh, we had 15 PhD students working on very specific topics in computational design. Uh, students uh, from all over the regions, from all over the five uh, regions, uh, and also uh, with uh, panelists also from the five regions as well. And the second uh, workshop is scheduled to be in December 2021. Uh, anybody who is actually interested in computational design research uh, and is doing currently their, maybe their PhD work can uh, definitely participate on behalf of uh, ASCAD, if they are affiliated with the region, um, uh, it, it provides a platform for discussions uh, among these experts and looking at peer work also of other PhD students. As you know, PhD students are the ones actually doing the work and doing the research and uh, uh, their hands are in the dirt, as they say, so they uh, know more about the details and all of these technicalities. Uh, now, and this is also our, um, uh, I'm, I'm very honored to be among this um, uh, very enthusiastic and active uh, board of directors who are serving in this term. These are our um, uh, contact information and, and website. I just wanted to, to close by these open-ended uh, discussion points. And I think, um, uh, I, I hope you already have some uh, points in mind, but I just wanted to throw out there uh, some uh, questions and some issues that uh, might be relevant to this talk. Um, now, having seen all of this, and um, I, I think there might be a need to look at how the role of the architect is being defined or redefined, and the profession as well. Um, are we really working within a scenario of what's called the, um, the square peg in a round hole uh, or a horseless uh, carriage? And by that, uh, this is the famous uh, uh, quote by Yehuda Kalei, one of the pioneers in this field. Um, the square peg in the round hole typically means the, that the use of the tool of a new tool or a new technology is kind of misdirected in a way, and it poorly fits an existing process uh, within practice, for example. So uh, in that way, design would suffer from the technology because it's kind of not typically uh, placed well. And the horseless carriage uh, is referring to the, 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 
that there should be a kind of a fundamental change maybe to the culture of practice itself uh, because the fundamental task does not uh, change. So how does uh, the design actually practice change? How do the affordances offered by the technology uh, change the design practice? So it's an interesting kind of, of question in between those two. Um, typically, we, we all have kind of perceptions of what the digital means and um, having seen this and, and having moving into these kind of digital transformations, how are these perceptions now among the CAD community itself and among uh, laymen, among uh, the disciplines, among the, uh, the AC construction industry at large, how are these perceived, how are these re-understood and explored now, that's an open-ended kind of, of question. Um, the triad that exists between research and academia and practice, uh, how is it really, if ever, informing design practice? Is it really working cor properly or correctly um, in, in different areas in the world now? Research typically kind of um, proceeds in a way and informs um, a practice by some of the findings that uh, typically lead to the use of, for example, uh, innovative materials, innovative kind of construction techniques, uh, design approaches, methodologies, and, and so on. So how are these kind of working within the MENA region? Is that happening? Is that happening in some areas, some others not? How is that kind of mechanism working? And uh, if you remember that kind of spectrum between heritage and globalization, where are we now and, and where should we be heading, actually? This is kind of an open end. It's a dilemma, of course, and it's a debate. Um, and also where uh, do we focus our digital investment? Are we sticking to, is the kind of BIM, BIM and cloud computing, uh, is it gonna go for another 10 years or so, um, topping that kind of digital investment scenario or are there other kind of uh, dominating uh, aspects that are coming forward? I, I presented, for example, robotics as one of those that are not really uh, being invested in right now. So just to throw that out and see, is this something that is worth uh, exploring or is it something that is kind of impossible in our uh, region of the world so it's just uh, uh, an issue out there and lastly what sort of other disciplines um, practices and frameworks materials maybe uh, that should be involved in the design construction process are we sticking to the same kind of frameworks out there the same uh, uh, roles the same key players the same uh, disciplines involved or are there other kind of um, uh, frameworks that are becoming different now with all of these technologies uh, coming, with all of these giga projects being defined. Um, and, and how disruptive really are we talking here? Are we talking about a total dramatic transformation or is it uh, sort of uh, just very uh, small uh, interjections in, in some of the processes? How, how disruptive is that uh, in your kind of uh, imagination? Uh, again, I'm sorry to be so long. I know I exceeded my time, but but thank you very much. And I'm again, I'm honored uh, to be among this uh, distinguished and prestigious group and looking forward to um, to your questions and comments, if any, and looking forward to any future collaboration. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Sharif. Uh, quite a, an exciting, uh, let's say, topic that is uh, quite new to the region in a sense where you know there's a, a bit of resistance towards change and that kind of brings me to the first question um and i'll uh, help people uh, kick off on the q a no. <laughs> um so my, my first thought when i when you've spoken about the uh, opportunities and challenges of introducing this type of design into the region is what are the challenges besides i mean the challenges related to, uh, you know, material availability, technology availability, and so on. Do you think part of the challenge is also the mentality of accepting something that is, uh, let's say, very technology related and uh, a huge change uh, from the norm? Yeah, that's a very good question, Mariam. Thank you. Um, uh, typically, this is always the case in any technology, of course. Um, and not only, of course, in the MENA region, so it's not so specific, but of course, maybe a, a larger magnitude. Um, but, but, but typically you find, um, and the resistance can come from, um, I, I think one of the primary sources is, um, am I going out of business or not? You know, is this technology a replacement? And 
if so, you know, because some of these are really looking at, you know, linear operations, looking at um, a kind of reducing uh, labor, you know, it's, it's in its, um, in its core, it's, it's kind of, a, a, people think of it as a substitution and maybe, um, you know, a lot of people who have this kind of, um, um, they tell you, I have the experience, I have the sort of the tacit knowledge that cannot be replaced by uh, this system or this uh, robot or whatever, which is true, of, of obviously. Um, uh, all of these kind of um, uh, experiences, uh, you, you, uh, unless, of course, you know, we're going more and more into, you know, AI and machine learning and obviously learning from experiences. And it's all this dilemma of, uh, um, that brings a lot of another type of resistance as well as you're gonna replace me actually with an, an AI kind of system that does all that and kind of captures all my knowledge and then I would really be out of business at that point so uh, I think this is a global kind of worldwide maybe concern uh, but also you have the um, uh, maybe what you're referring to more is on the regional or local level about you know mindsets about uh, you know uh, typically with with um, uh, if you, if we go back you know somewhere where we intro first introduced BIM where we first introduced CAD the typical resistance you know that you have with the learning curve right so uh, it's about uh, really just the, the you know uh, it's a new tool to learn it's going to be a headache I'm I'm used to this. Um, this does it for me. I don't need that kind of, of, of system or tool to do that. I'm not confident with the tool, with the results, you know, and it's a junk in, junk out uh, system. So, you know, that kind of, of, of mentality. Um, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, um, despite all of these resistances, uh, you know, life goes on. So, so these technologies get embedded, they get adopted. And it's all about the, the smart way of, of how to really adapt and adopt them, right? So, so there is a level of adaptation that needs to happen. And the, the smart way to do that is, you know, because typically within an organization or a firm, uh, you would have different views about people who are, you know, rejecting and, and having doubts and accepting and, you know, uh, or accepting with flying colors. So, but, but the smart, uh, it's, it's all about how you as an organization uh, sort of, uh, it, it goes back to the, again, the, squ the square peg and the carriage thing. So are you really kind of uh, uh, adapting it in a, in a smart way? Are you adapting it to your practices? Are your practices suited to that? Do you need to change your practice? Do you need to kind of develop an, another workflow? Because at the end of the day, it's it's really not about the tool. It's not about the software, for example. It's really a mindset. It's really more of a workflow. So it, if it if something is an enabler or a facilitator in that regard, then be it. You know, then 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 we need to kind of sit together as an organization and think about, you know, how to, how to develop that. Um, but if it's just mere resistance out of you know just um, uh, learning and and that's it. That, that that's a typical scenario. Uh, there needs to be kind of a way that, uh, and that I think lies on the shoulders of the, um, uh, you know, advocates for, you know, the CAD community itself, uh, the, the software developers themselves who are doing this. Uh, you need to sell that in a way that is really more maybe convincing, you know, it's about the, the incentives and about the real value and the benefits that you're gaining from these uh, kind of systems because, uh, there is a typical kind of uh, uh, mindset about that they're just technologies. I can use them or I cannot use them. It's um, uh, you know, it's, it's just a tool. Yes, of course, it's just a tool. But if 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 taken with that perception, then maybe there's something wrong with that tool that was sold to you in the first place. There, there needs to be a transformation in the way that we kind of think or rethink our way of, of practicing uh, architecture in that regard so I, i'm not sure if i answered the question but i mean these are these are some of the thoughts i, I just had in mind no i think uh, i i believe that the entire your entire talk was a huge wealth of knowledge um, to be very very honest with you and mm -hmm. and the fact that you had gone through all of the let's say the trends that are currently in the region and the different technologies. I mean, for me, I, I, I only had an idea of 
uh, using robotic technology for concrete and maybe clay. Uh, mm -hmm. But when you started talking about it going into metal structures, uh, into wood stitching, um, into all of these, and these are all new to me. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. fantastic how much uh, people have kind of moved forward with the, the you know, utilizing uh, technology, robotics, in, in improving building techniques. I mean, it's all experimental at this point still, mm -hmm. but we're moving in such a fast pace that it's no longer going to be applied in, in low-rise uh, buildings or like a wow. ground floor building. It'll start be, being applied on uh, high-rise buildings. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a scary uh, notion if, it, if, yeah. if you start thinking of it in a dystopian kind of manner, but mm -hmm. um, it, it kind of opens up this realm of, like you had mentioned, reduction in time, in, uh, as, in construction time, reduction in material uh, waste, which is a huge issue when it comes to construction. Mm -hmm. um, and, and reduction in, in, in labor sometimes is seen as a bad thing. Um, uh, but I mean, there's two, two faces or two sides to that story. Um, uh, but, but I, if, I may, if I may interject there, I mean, the, 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 um, the, the negative kind of perception of I'm going to be replaced, I think, needs to change a bit because typically, um, you know, yes, obviously, if, if you're doing the same thing over and over again and your, your job is, you know, job, quote unquote, is, is, um, is you know, to, to do a very tedious task. Mm -hmm. then yeah it's time to, to you know to look for another job and not to you to look for another job but time for the industry to think about the types of, of of jobs that need to be out there there needs to be a redefinition of roles and responsibilities and and the types of, of jobs and practices that are more kind of meaningful and these tools could should kind of alleviate that and relieve mm -hmm. some of the you know the cognitive burden and relieve the kind of the tedious work and lets you work more on the creative stuff, you know? So, so the redefinition of these sort of creative professions that should be out there, which should be, you know, very, very much more focused. So you're really working on what you need to work on and, and that's it. You, you don't have to, you know, do those tedious tasks anymore. Something or somebody can do it for you, but you really need to focus on what your uh, intellectual kind of uh, component is. Correct, correct. Um, so we've run out of time, actually, um, <laughs> but thank you so much for the talk. Uh, it was, like I mentioned before, and I'll mention again, it's, it's been a wealth of knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. And I believe it's just the beginning. All of the questions that you had put in the end, uh, I think they are drivers for additional webinars and additional, um, let's say, responses to these questions. Um, so I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Sharif, um, and remind everyone else that this webinar is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube. Um, and uh, if um, I'll, I'll send you, uh, Dr. Sharif, uh, another webinar link. Uh, we'll literally talk me, uh, yourself, and Mustafa very quickly. Um, and thank you again to everyone who was able to attend with us this evening. We appreciate the time that you've taken and hope to see you again. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam and, and Dr. Mustafa for this invitation and, and thanks to everybody. I hope it was beneficial and looking forward to uh, collaborate more. Thank you very much. Thank you.